everyone! Today we'll be talking about how Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony helped save thousands of lives during one of the deadliest sieges in recorded history, the Siege of Leningrad. We will be exploring some of the historical context of Leningrad that shows why Shostakovich's symphony was so impactful. We will then look at the siege itself and how the performance of the symphony during the siege marked an important turning point in the course of World War II. And finally, we'll explore the international impact of the symphony and how it strengthened the alliance between the Soviet Union and the US during the war. As you may have noticed, I'm wearing my Shasti shirt. These four notes are kind of like his musical signature derived from his initials DSCH. D is just the note D. S, spelled more or less phonetically, becomes S, which in German notation is E flat. C is just the note C, and H in German notation is B natural. Put it all together and you get D, E flat, C, B. You can hear this motif in a lot of his works, most prominently the eighth string quartet. But back to the topic at hand, the siege of Leningrad, as well as some of the surrounding history, like Stalin's purges of the 1930s, were extremely brutal and gruesome, so there will be mentions of things like torture, mass killings, and cannibalism, just to give you an idea, but we will not be going into anything in excessively graphic detail. But other than that, I am excited to get into it, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy and thank you for watching. So Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony is often called the Leningrad Symphony, and we need to understand the history and the culture of the city that it was dedicated to. Leningrad, known today as as St. Petersburg was Russia's capital from the early 1700s until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Even before the siege, the people of the city had been through a lot. During the 1917 revolutions, they had witnessed both the joy of overthrowing the oppressive imperial government, but also the violence and bloodshed of the conflict. Shostakovich, who was a kid at the time, had paraded around the house wearing a red ribbon, the color of the revolution, and with his siblings had pretended to be soldiers in the rebellion, but he had also seen kids his own age murdered in the chaos. The economy was also in a decline, and the people of Leningrad often found themselves living in crowded conditions with not much food or heating. At the Leningrad Conservatory, where Shostakovich was studying piano, he and the other students crowded around small stoves fed with scraps of wood so that their fingers wouldn't freeze. And the most exciting part of their day was when the truckload of cabbages would arrive at the conservatory door, and they would each get their fill of watery cabbage soup. The city was a cultural center for the arts, especially music, and Shostakovich's compositions at the time were quite on trend with the experimental style of the 1920s. His works often featured bizarre subjects like a nose that falls off a person's face and then goes around applying for government jobs. And in line with how the government viewed art as an important tool for propaganda, Shostakovich often included the sounds of machinery that depict a country becoming industrialized and sometimes wrote mass songs that proclaimed the joys of collective labor. It's unclear whether or how much Shostakovich agreed with these political statements, but at that time, it would have been dangerous to express his true opinions. Either way, his music was well received in both the Soviet Union, as it was called then, and internationally, with works like his first symphony gaining popularity in Europe and in the US. However, with the rise of Joseph Stalin in the late 1920s, things began to get a lot worse. As part of the first five-year plan, he expanded the system of forced collective farming that had begun under Vladimir Lenin. The Soviet Union's peasants, along with nomadic people who had no experience with agriculture, were forced to give up their belongings and cultures and move onto these farms. And wealthier peasants who were deemed too bourgeois were often killed. Much of the grain that was produced was sold overseas to buy factory equipment to turn the Soviet Union into a modern industrial country, but the peasants who had done all the work weren't left with enough to eat. In the growing system of industrial factories, experts who actually knew what they were doing were often fired or even killed because they were considered enemies of the common working people, which ironically led to lower production rates. Stalin set unreasonably high quotas for food and industrial production, and when people didn't meet them, he arrested them. The result of this five-year plan was that roughly six 
6 million people died of hunger. But Stalin blamed the death on high-ranking officials who were supposedly trying to sabotage his plan and had them killed too. People in urban cities like Leningrad and Moscow often didn't know the full reality of these horrors as they were only told the happy propaganda version, but Stalin's attentions would soon be turned to them. In the 1930s, Stalin began a series of purges called the Great Terror in those urban centers, where he arrested or killed people for alleged treason. His goals were to, one, get rid of his political rivals, two, create a new collective race of people, and three, to make a display of his absolute power over the country. He began these purges in Leningrad as he disliked the city for how close it was to the capitalist countries in the West and how easily its culture could be influenced by those countries. The secret police, or NKVD, arrested thousands of innocent people and tortured them into confessing the crimes that they had supposedly committed. Some were sent to labor camps, others were shot. Stalin then turned to Leningrad's flourishing artistic scene. Artists were denounced for being too formalist or focused more on form and technique than content when they were supposed to be writing about socialist realism, which would depict the joys of collective labor, though with the six million deaths on the collective farms, it was anything but realistic. The tricky thing was that nobody really knew what formalism and socialist realism actually were. Even Stalin couldn't provide a good definition, but that ambiguity made it easier for Stalin to arrest artists that he disliked. For example, Shostakovich's opera Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk district, although popular with the general public, was denounced by Stalin for its, quote, coarseness and savagery, and the public had no choice but to agree with him because disagreeing with Stalin got you killed. Conversely, Shostakovich's ballet The Bright Stream was criticized for being too happy because it didn't properly depict the hard labor of the working classes. And this trend would continue throughout Shostakovich's life, where his music would be attacked for being too simple, then for being too complex, too emotional, too emotionless, etc. Shostakovich's complex relationship with the government also meant that sometimes he would be seen as a villain, but other times he would be a hero. For example, his fourth symphony was deemed too tragic because it didn't show the Soviet utopia that the government wanted, and Shostakovich was forced to cancel its premiere. However, the government praised his fifth symphony as Shostakovich taking in their fair criticism, even though that's probably far from the truth. And this power of open interpretation was itself a key feature of Shostakovich's music. See, in the fifth Fifth Symphony, the government had heard a triumphant finale, which to them meant the eventual perfection of the Soviet state. The general public, however, heard a victory that seemed forced, like being arrested and tortured and still having to keep a smile on their faces. And when Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony would be played, this element of interpretation was one of the key reasons why the piece became so influential, because the government and the public both heard what they needed. During Stalin's purges, other artists like the poet Olga Bergoltz, theater director Sevalod Merhold, and poet Osip Mandelstam were arrested, tortured, killed, or sent off to labor camps. Shostakovich actually tried to intervene on behalf of his friends and colleagues. In fact, he showed incredible bravery in helping others, but was very nervous about defending himself. At this point, Shostakovich had begun sleeping on the landing outside of his apartment with his suitcase by his side, so that when the secret police inevitably came to arrest him, they wouldn't disturb his wife and newborn daughter. It is unclear how Shostakovich avoided arrest. One theory is that because he was an international celebrity as a composer, even if most Western countries didn't know the full extent of Stalin's terror, it would still look rather suspicious if someone as well-loved as Shostakovich suddenly disappeared. Another theory is that the NKVD had been collecting evidence him and were planning to arrest him, but were simply distracted by the onset of World War II. At one point, he was actually taken in for questioning and probably would have been killed, but it didn't happen because his executioner was arrested and was going to be executed. Either way, Shostakovich was not arrested, but like everyone else, he lived in constant fear of being next. The NKVD continued their arrests, tortures, and killings, and when they got too powerful, Stalin purged them as well. One of the Soviet Union's best generals had seen that Adolf Hitler and his Nazi war machine 
Spain were on the rise, and he wanted to modernize the Soviet Air Force and tank force to be prepared for an attack. Stalin saw the general as a potential threat to his authority and actually cooperated with Hitler to depose him. And afraid of being overthrown by his own military, Stalin had them purged as well. By 1939, Stalin had destroyed his own economy, decimated his own military, and brutally tortured and executed millions of his own population ready for World War II. Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union began on June 22, 1941. Operation Barbarossa, as it was called, had three destinations. The fertile soil and natural resources of Ukraine and the major cities of Moscow and Leningrad. This invasion should not have been a surprise. Multiple spies had informed Stalin that the attack would take place and had even pinned down the exact date. German reconnaissance planes had been flying over the country and taking pictures of important military bases, and civilians living near the border could see German troops gathered there. Stalin, in some form of blatant denial, ignored all of these reports and tried to convince himself that he still had time to prepare a country that he had, you know, just destroyed. When German forces did attack, however, Soviet soldiers were still horribly unprepared, with outdated machinery, insufficient ammunition, and very little training. So the first few days of Operation Barbarossa were essentially a massacre. Soviet soldiers were thrown at German forces in full frontal attacks because Stalin, as you can probably tell by now, did not care how many of his own people died. Some people in the Soviet Union actually saw Hitler as someone who would free them from Stalin's brutality and welcomed the German soldiers. However, Hitler's belief was that Russian people were an inferior race and should be treated as less than human, so when these villagers came out of their homes with gifts and food, he massacred them. Hitler had predicted that Operation Barbarossa would only take four months, and at the rate that things were going, he seemed to be right. On the Soviet side, Stalin's generals were not allowed to question his orders in fear of being shot. Official news sources had to lie about the state of the war, because if they told Stalin that they were losing, they would be shot. After about a week, someone finally told him how the war was really going, and Stalin had a mental breakdown and retreated into his country home. A few days later, someone went to talk to him and convinced him that yes, he could lead the country to victory, and Stalin was inspired to give a speech about how all Soviet people were united and how they would win the war against the enemy. Let's just take a moment for all of the disgustingly ironic things that have happened so far, because there have been a lot, and I promise you there will be more. Meanwhile, in Leningrad, after hearing the announcement that they were were at war with Germany, there was an overwhelming response of people wanting to help fight. In fact, in the first couple of days, a hundred thousand people showed up to volunteer for military service. Shostakovich himself also volunteered, but was turned down, officially because of his poor eyesight, and unofficially because he was a very popular composer and the government recognized that his music could be used as propaganda. So by now you're probably wondering, why were people so eager to help fight for a government that had just spent years trying to kill them. And the fact was that most of them weren't fighting for Stalin. They were fighting to defend their families and their homeland, and if that meant temporarily fighting on the same side as Stalin, so be it. In Leningrad, the people who weren't actively fighting were busy preparing other defenses. For example, Shostakovich for a short time helped dig ditches that were meant to slow German tanks. He was also a rooftop firefighter, helping to put out the fires from bombs, though someone had rigged his schedule so that he was never in any real danger. Again, he was more useful composing propaganda music. The preservation of Leningrad's cultural monuments was also very important. As I mentioned before, Hitler viewed Russian people as subhuman, and Leningraders made great efforts to prove him wrong. They shipped pieces from the Hermitage Museum out east where it would be safer, they covered the city's statues in sandbags to protect them from bombs, and Leningrad music groups continued to give concerts, in fact about 160 per month to both civilians and soldiers. And in doing so, they were proving to Hitler that they were very much human and that they had a culture and heritage to be proud of. In mid-July, about a month after Hitler first invaded the Soviet Union, the first ration cards were issued in Leningrad. 
However, no one was really worried yet, as grocery stores still had plenty of food in them. City officials even turned away shipments of extra supplies because they didn't want to appear desperate. However, by this time, the German military was getting closer to Leningrad, and it became more dangerous for supplies to be sent in and for people to be evacuated out. Many people actually didn't want to leave because it was a point of pride to stay in their native city. Shostakovich wanted to stay for this reason and because because he had begun working on his Seventh Symphony and didn't want to be disrupted by relocating. His wife, Nino, was furious that he would risk the lives of their children like that, and after a bit, Shostakovich finally agreed to move somewhere safer. However, by then it was too late, because on August 31st, the last railway connected with the rest of the country was severed. On September 8th, German forces closed around the city, and thus began the longest siege in recorded history. It lasted 872 days, one and a half million people died. So Hitler's plan for Leningrad was utter annihilation. Because it was important in terms of military strategy, as well as a symbol of Bolshevism, which Hitler hated, he wanted Leningrad wiped off the face of the earth. German planes bombed the city in a series of air raids, destroying many of its buildings and making it especially dangerous for the people who were out on the streets waiting in line for their rations. But Hitler didn't want to waste his resources on an actual invasion, and so he simply sent a bunch of troops to surround the city and prevent any supplies from going in, and then just waited for Leningrad to starve itself to death. Leningrad officials were supposed to have dispersed the emergency food supply around the city, but this job had been delayed, and so it ended up that all of their food was stored in one location. German forces found this location and bombed it. Starvation. Rationing at first gave people 250 to 500 grams of bread per day, depending on age and how much manual labor their jobs required. However, since the city was running out of actual flour, they started using filler like floor sweepings and sawdust, which didn't have much nutritional value. The first starvation deaths were recorded with some surprise. By late November, most people were only getting 125 grams of bread per day. Day, and more people began dying. To put things into perspective, this is 125 grams of bread. This isn't one meal or like a midnight snack. This is all you had for the entire day. Not everyone in Leningrad was starving though, just to be clear. Some well-connected officials not only had an excess of food like pork and butter and chocolate, they bragged about it to the people who had almost nothing. And for the vast majority of people, they started eating anything that wouldn't kill them. Wallpaper paste, furniture glue, books, leather, lipstick, face powder, paint ingredients, tank lubricant. For protein, they turned to horses that had fallen over from exhaustion, household cats, dogs, people. Because Leningrad was so far north, during the winter months, there would only be a few hours of sunlight. German air raids had blasted out people's windows or destroyed their homes altogether. And since there was no way to get coal or firewood from outside the city and the electricity wasn't working anymore, Leningrad became very cold, very dark, and as more people died, very, very quiet. Now, how did the rest of Leningrad survive? 125 grams of bread should not have been enough physically to sustain life. But at the end of the siege, after the evacuations and deaths, there were still about 700,000 survivors. Doctors in the city had noticed that counterintuitively, people who got up, went to work, or otherwise found something to do actually had better chances of survival than those who laid down and tried to conserve energy. And so people found things to do. They formed bucket brigades to help each other get water from the frozen river. They organized search parties for missing friends and colleagues. People went to the library to read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. The Leningrad radio continued to broadcast as much as they could, with poets like Olga Bergolt reading their works on air. The Leningrad musical comedy theater remained open, even though at one performance they started off with three musketeers and finished with only two. These things might seem excessive or a waste of resources, but in fact, they were vitally important in giving people a 
a reason to keep on living. Mental and physical health are very much interconnected. For example, depression is known to lead to physical conditions like poor sleep patterns, lowered immune response, and chronic illness. During the siege, the people who were able to get to a better place mentally, for example through music or poetry or by helping others, were often healthier physically and therefore had a greater chance of survival. And those non-essentials, as it turned out, were in fact essential. As one survivor put it, truly, man does not live by bread alone. Speaking of music and Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, now we finally reach the main focus of the video, but I promise all of that context will become very important. Shostakovich began writing the symphony in July of 1941, which was after the start of the invasion of the Soviet Union, but before the start of the siege of Leningrad. However, the way that Shostakovich composed was that he usually created a piece in his head before writing it down, so he might have come up with the musical themes of the symphony much earlier. This is important in trying to analyze the famous march theme in the first movement, and whether it represents Hitler's invasion or Stalin's terrors. We need to be careful about the things that Shostakovich supposedly said about his music, for example on the radio or in news articles. Sometimes these speeches and articles were written by somebody else, so they wouldn't contain anything that criticized the Soviet government or was demoralizing to the Soviet cause. And even if they were Shostakovich's own words, he wouldn't have been able to express his opinions fully because if he said the wrong thing, say it with me now, he would be shot. So of course Shostakovich couldn't have gone out and said that this hateful melody represented Stalin and instead left it as an all-encompassing theme of evil. He also apparently said that music, real music, can never be literally tied to a theme. This music is about all forms of terror, slavery, the bondage of the spirit. Shostakovich initially doubted that his symphony would be of any use to anyone because after all they were fighting a war, but then in mid-September someone convinced him to talk about it over the radio and to tell people that he was writing this music because life must go on in Leningrad. And this had a very powerful impact on the people of the city. One listener said that it had reminded them that in the middle of all this starvation and cannibalism and unspeakable suffering, art was alive. Gradually, people began to push Shostakovich to see his work as a testimony of Leningrad's struggles and strength, and eventually that's what it became. Something that spoke to people and moved through their day-to-day -day struggles beside them, but also gave them hope for a better future. Shostakovich wrote the last movement of the symphony after officials had him and his family evacuated out of the city. He was away from the front lines of the war, but was often unable to compose knowing what the people back home were going. Through. But he finished the symphony in December 1941, and the world premiere took place in Kuybyshev, the city he was staying in, in March 1942. The performance was hugely successful, and orchestras all over the West were asking to perform it. The Soviet government then recognized the importance of the piece in improving international relations, because even though the Soviet Union and the US were allies in World War II, they were still rather suspicious of each other. Russians tended to view Americans as soulless capitalists, and many Americans saw Russians as cold-hearted communists. In addition, the Soviet Union was asking its allies to open up a second front to divert German forces away from the bloodbath in their country, and also for free material aid like food, industrial equipment, and military vehicles. The US was already losing a war in the Pacific with Japan, so they couldn't open up a second front. The president, Franklin Roosevelt, willingly sent material aid, but most of the American people disagreed and wanted something in return from the Soviets. The Soviets, if you were wondering, had contributed quite a bit, and that was the lives of their soldiers. In fact, by the end of the war between the three major allies, the Soviet Union had suffered 90 to 95 percent of the military casualties. The the Soviet government decided to send Shostakovich's symphony to ease tensions on future negotiations. The 252-page orchestral score was put on a microfilm, driven across Russia, flown to Iran, driven to Egypt, flown to Brazil, then to Florida, and finally Washington DC, where the American agent responsible for the microfilm left it on his lunch tray, and the whole thing almost ended up in the cafeteria garbage cans. 
Moving on, American orchestras got to play the symphony, and when people heard it, along with the story of the microfilm and other war stories from Leningrad, they fangirled all over Shostakovich. He made it to the cover of Time magazine, where the media portrayed him as just a regular guy, just like any other American dad who loved sports and cars and reading Jack London. To be clear though, not everyone liked the piece. Some thought that it was too simple or that it was just hollow propaganda. Rachmaninoff, for example, when asked his opinion, gave a long pause, then changed the subject. But for the most part, the symphony was very well received. And an important reason for this was, again, Shostakovich's ability to write music that could be openly interpreted. In the symphony, Americans heard the same struggle of sending loved ones off to war and the same hope for eventual victory. Even though they might not have heard the exact events that Shostakovich wanted to portray, such as the terror of Stalin's regime, the emotional narrative was still the same. Through the music, they discovered that Russian people weren't so different from American people after all. And so Shostakovich's symphony played a small but important role in convincing the American public that it was necessary to send aid to their Russian allies. Now, there was one more place that the symphony still needed to be played in, and that was Leningrad itself. The last remaining orchestra in the city was the Leningrad Radio Orchestra, and they had stopped playing in January after the musicians had begun dying of hunger. In March, city officials decided that some music was needed to boost people's morale, and they put up posters and went door to door recruiting musicians. Those who joined would get extra rations, and it would be something to do, which, as we saw before, tended to increase your chances of survival. At the first rehearsal, a whopping 15 musicians showed up. Shostakovich's symphony required an orchestra of more than 100, so more were brought in from the front lines to both serve in the orchestra and continue their military duties. And actually, the percussionist was at first thought to be dead, and his body had already been taken to the morgue, but the conductor, Carl Eliasberg, had went back to check and found that he was still breathing. Anyway, according to legend, Shostakovich had called for such a large orchestra because he knew that they would be getting extra food, and in doing so, was helping to keep them alive. The Seventh Symphony was a massive piece. If you'll remember, the score was 252 pages long, and the whole thing took about 80 minutes to play. At first, many of the orchestral musicians had been so weakened by hunger and cold that they felt overwhelmed by the whole thing. So in the meantime, they played some classics that they already knew, both on the radio and in live performances. The rest of Leningrad was getting very excited about the prospect of a symphony that essentially represented them and their struggle, combined with the arrival of spring, which meant food in the form of plants, because at this point, dandelions and tree bark were looking pretty good. The city began to regain a sense of hope. People were coming out of their homes to clean up the city streets, because over the course of the winter, a lot had gotten piled up underneath the snow, and there began to be a greater sense of community and common cause. Preparation of the symphony, however, was still slow going. The musicians were so exhausted that sometimes they just toppled over in the middle of rehearsal. Three of them died. The conductor, Eliasberg, was starving just as badly, but still kept discipline and gave encouragement. On the one hand, he threatened to withdraw rations if people showed up late to rehearsal. On the other hand, he continually expressed his faith that they had the strength to continue, and his dedication inspired them to do the best that they could. In rehearsal, they were able to play the piece in its entirety only once, at a dress rehearsal three days before the performance. The Leningrad premiere of Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony took place on August 9th, 1942. This was the day that Hitler had planned to be celebrating the fall of Leningrad, and having the performance on that day was like the middle finger of the whole symphony that was essentially a middle finger. The musicians were finally beginning to feel the same excitement that was effused throughout the audience. Unbeknownst to the musicians or the general public, the Soviet military had been tasked with bombarding German forces just outside the city so that German fire wouldn't interrupt in the middle of the performance. 
concert etiquette, even in the middle of a siege. In the concert hall, the electric lights were turned on for the first time in months, and there was a full audience. Regular people who had paid an entire day's rations for a ticket. That people would give up one of their most precious commodities to hear a classical concert. That alone should speak volumes about how important this music was to them. The orchestra began to play, and even though it wasn't artistically a great performance, that didn't really matter. Towards the end of the piece, when the musicians were about to be overwhelmed by the sheer force of the music, the audience rose to their feet as if willing them to continue. The last movement of Shostakovich's symphony depicted a sense of triumph that, in Leningrad in 1942, was still just a dream, but at that moment seemed possible. When the symphony was finished, there was silence and then thunderous applause. Eliasberg, much to his surprise, was given a bouquet of flowers from an audience member who said that they had been growing flowers at home because, quote, life must continue. The musicians were treated to a feast, after which they threw everything up because they weren't used to actual food anymore. The symphony had also been broadcast to the rest of the city who were listening at home, and as a form of psychological warfare, it had also been blasted on loudspeaker to German forces just outside the city. German soldiers, many of whom had never wanted to be there anyway, began to realize that they would never take Leningrad. Because here were people who went to concerts and wrote symphonies and lived with an intense defiance when the world around them was trying to kill them. And it was a turning point for the people of Leningrad as well, because although the siege would continue for another year and a half, people knew that they would be okay. And so that is Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony. If you want the story to end on a positive note, then there it is, because the rest of it is honestly kind of anticlimactic and rather sad. Well, I mean, the whole thing is sad, but you get what I mean. The conductor at the Leningrad premiere, Karl Eliasberg, was a hero in the city until the conductor of the more famous Leningrad Philharmonic returned from where he had been evacuated and, well, there wasn't room on the podium for two. Eliasberg continued to conduct around the Soviet Union but died in poverty and relative obscurity in 1978. There were two reunion concerts in which the surviving members of the Leningrad Radio Orchestra were called in and played from the same seats as they did in 1942. Shostakovich, who had been a hero both in the Soviet Union and internationally, quickly fell out of favor with the Soviet government after the war, and his music was actually banned in 1948. Since the war was over and the Soviet Union and the US no longer needed to fight on the same side, international relations worsened again and turned into the Cold War. Western music, novels, and movies were banned and in the Soviet Union. Shostakovich was called an American traitor, and nothing about his Seventh Symphony could save him. It seems that the American public still loved him, and when he visited for a peace conference in 1949, they wanted him to jump through the window and stay in America, but unfortunately he couldn't because his wife and children were still back in the Soviet Union, being held hostage by the Soviet government. Another purge of the arts seemed very possible, but then in 1953, Stalin died. A few years later, the ban on Shostakovich's works was lifted, and it became a little bit easier to speak openly about the atrocities that Stalin had committed in his 25 years as dictator. Still, Shostakovich was often forced to sign articles denouncing his own works, and as was his way of surviving, he did so without putting up much of a fight. So yeah, lots of loose ends, lots of people who weren't recognized for their work, or who died anonymously and were buried in mass graves. Looking back on it, even through the heavily diluted version that we get through books and articles and things, it seems almost surreal. The suffering that all of these millions of people went through is incomprehensible. And in stark contrast, the fact that they were able to survive and create something beautiful when surrounded by so much darkness that blows my mind. So that is about it for this one. I hope you all enjoyed and learned something interesting. Thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time.